Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Simply Science. I'm your host, Ari Goldberg. On this month's show, we're going to discover how they control and screen animals for diseases at the airport. We'll also learn about robotic pills and circular economy. But first, what happens when a second grade teacher discovers a love of astronomy and wants to become an astrophysicist? Donna Hanover is that story. Rosario Cecilio Flores Eli is getting a master's degree in astrophysics. K stars are cooler than the sun, but warmer, obviously, than the M dwarfs. Rosario was the first in her family to graduate from high school and then the first to graduate from college at Lehman in the Bronx, and she proudly became a second grade bilingual education teacher. I want my students to see like, that their teacher looks like them and comes from similar uh, backgrounds. So how does one go from being a second grade teacher to being an astrophysics master's student at the City University of New York? Originally started with a group of friends the Cosmos uh, show came out with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And so every Sunday we were like, have debates about uh, whatever topic Dr. Tyson would talk about that weekend. Then we venture out to the Custer Observatory out in Long Island. And there uh, I was pretty amazed. I liked the clear night sky. I saw Jupiter and Saturn and, their, and its moons from the telescope for the first time and I was just, blown away by it. She'll always remember her chance to attend adult space camp. She was so interested in astronomy that her husband, Juan Ellie, a pilot, suggested she go back to school. She feared she wasn't good at math, but kept at it, taking classes at night. Nine years after her first degree, she earned another in physics. Meanwhile, the City University of New York was setting up an astrophysics master's program for people who don't yet have the research experience to go for a PhD. Professor Jillian Bellaberry is the director. The goal of a bridge program is to uh, take students who have a lot of potential, but for some reason are, were lacking some resources or some opportunities that they're not competitive for a PhD program at this time, and give them those opportunities. Rosario's sister, Doris, saw a flyer about it. She texted me the flyer and she told me, Rosario, you need to apply. I just got like goosebumps once I saw the flyer. I was like, okay, maybe this is my chance. When Rosario got word she was accepted, she was over the moon. I have to say, it feels like a dream. The master's students take difficult classes and do research. They have mentors to help them stay on track. It's not easy. This semester, they are taking computational methods, which is a lot of coding um, that relates to physics. Some of them are doing research on uh, simulations of galaxy formation. Some of them are doing research on low mass stars or stars with planets around them. What is it about Rosario that you think will make her a great astrophysicist? Rosario ha has a first career as a second grade teacher, running after all those kids all day, like, I don't know how she had the energy to then do a bunch of really hard physics at night. I think Rosario has shown that she has the tenacity and drive to really be successful, even when the odds are stacked against her. CUNY partners for the master's program with the Flatiron Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Simons Foundation and the American Museum of Natural History. The students receive a stipend and it takes two years. They started with five students, but in the future plan to have 20. Okay, Professor Emily Rice of Macaulay Honors College teaches them a course called Unsolved Problems in Astrophysics. It's really learning about modern astrophysics research, current astrophysics research, the way that a scientist would. As a woman yourself in astrophysics, what is your advice to Rosario? I would advise, keep it up, hang in there. Um, it can be tough a lot of the times, but find your people, find the people that support you, find the people that make you excited about these things, and then run with them and keep going. Do you think she has what it takes? Yeah. Rosario's parents, who worked hard and never got to go beyond middle school, are very proud of her. What is her goal? Eventually, I would love to work at, at NASA 
or at a, an institution like the Museum of Natural History. Your aim is not to go to space? I would love to go to space. If the opportunity comes, yes. So don't be surprised if it happens someday. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. JFK Airport is among the world's busiest, but of course humans aren't the only thing that travel. Our Andrew Falzone went to a facility at the airport which makes sure animals that are traveling to and from destinations don't bring diseases with them. Rolling around in the hay may seem like horseplay, but for the folks who work at the Ark at JFK, animal care is serious business. It's about keeping both animals and people safe. It's the first, um, kind of the first station where animals uh, can be observed if there is any uh, concern that there might be a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease, or zoonosis, is a disease that can make its way from animals to humans. According to the World Health Organization, there are over 200 types of zoonoses, among them SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Other well-known zoonoses include Lyme disease, HIV, Ebola, rabies, malaria, and West Nile virus. But the need to defend against these diseases was recognized long before the COVID-19 pandemic. The idea for the ARC initi initiated with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in approximately 2011, 2012. They were surveying the cargo landscape and in recognition of JFK's critical role in importing animals into the United States, but really needed expansion and updating to current biosecurity and national security standards. Domesticated pets can carry zoonotic disease and the ARC JFK can help you travel with a pet almost anywhere in the world with enough notice, but their primary clientele is of the equine variety. The major animal that we work with is horses. Uh, because those animals are coming into the United States from all over the world. And there is a mandatory three, seven, and 30-day quarantine for animals from different countries. And the person who oversees it all is Dr. Vincent DeChico, the Chief Veterinarian Biosecurity Compliance Officer at the ARC. Biosecurity is to make sure that um, the, the, all the regulations for safe handling of animals, personnel, equipment, and does not pose any sort of a threat of any kind of foreign diseases into the United States. And because of those strict regulations imposed by U.S. Customs and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, access is so tightly controlled that we weren't able to visit the stable area while the horses were under the ARC's care, and so any horse video we show you was provided by the ARC. Every horse imaginable can come through here. We have thoroughbreds, we have warm bloods, we have gypsy cobs, Spanish horses. The horses all arrive via airplane, and while in the air, they remain in these jet stalls anywhere between one to three horses to a stall. And as the horses make their way into the ark, their care begins with very close observation and inspection. We observe them as they're coming in, to notice if there are any ticks on their body or any open lesions that can be infective. There are some diseases that manifest by welts. Depending on where the ark came from, the quarantine is subject to different rules. Some horses are only released after examination by a USDA inspector. Once the stall is sealed, each has its own air filtration system to filter out airborne pathogens, and all areas of the ark are constantly treated with an environmentally safe disinfectant. We use a solution called intervention, which is an accelerated hydrogen peroxide, and this will kill just about 
and destroy just about any type of um, um, bacteria or even viruses. Not only can animals spread disease, but people can spread disease too. That's why before the workday starts or ends at the Ark, the crew has to hit the showers. The Ark even maintains an on-site incinerator to dispose of just about anything that came into contact with a quarantined horse. And once the horse is given a clean bill of health, it's off to the next destination, wherever that might be. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. Recycling plastics works, but it takes a lot of energy to make that happen. From transporting it to recycling centers, to the extra fossil fuels needed to make them into new products. But what if you could do it locally with renewable energy like solar power? Come to the Circular Economy Manufacturing on Governor's Island to see how. Most plastic in the U.S. is sent abroad for processing and then shipped back to the U.S. to be made into products using fossil fuels. It turns out a company called Circular Economy Manufacturing located on Governor's Island, is proving all of it could be done locally. It'll stay right around 350. I cook it for 10 minutes to get this effect. I'm gonna turn it off. I'll go ahead and open it up and, and show you one of the new lights that we're gonna be making. Awesome. We're gonna take uh, one of these great little uh, cork LED lights that are rechargeable. We'll drill a little hole, put it in the bottom, and when it's dark out, this makes a really cool light. And voila, some sustainable fun lights born out of a recycling micro factory in a shipping container powered by the sun. It all started after winning the 2019 NYC Curb to Market Challenge, which its theme was to turn NYC's trash into products. My name is Barrett Roth. I'm the co-founder and director of Circular Economy Manufacturing. And this uh, micro factory you see here is our first installation, and we hope to have many more. Governor's Island was a perfect fit as it plans to become a major climate hub and already has several initiatives. Armed with a team of engineers and designers, the project came to life last April, despite being slowed down by the pandemic. So what is circular economy exactly? So the circular economy starts with renewable energy and really tries to keep all of our materials in use. If we design everything into one of those two categories so that it can either be recycled at the end of its life or composted at the end of its life, then there is no landfill, there is no waste, and we have what we are striving for, which is a circular economy. High density polyethylene is used to make detergent bottles, milk jugs, comes in these colors. Another plastic to be recycled one might not have thought of, film canisters. We are now getting a bag like this every two weeks from one photo lab in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. So even if you were diligent in recycling them, they were gonna end up in landfill. Whereas here, we can turn them into useful products. So we're gonna make planters out of these. They make great watertight products. The plastic flake fall to the bottom of the mold. We're heating the mold, and when those plastic flakes fall to the, the bottom, they start to melt. They go from a solid to a liquid. So it's just gravitational force. So we can make some really big things, including you know four kids' chairs at once, perhaps even six. But this is the first one. Um, it's gotten a lot of use this summer. We laser engrave the coastline on this mold to reflect what our Earth would look like if all of our ice melts where my thumb is used to be Florida. A cautionary tell to remind us we need to change the way we are doing things. We'll be selling products first to individuals or citizens, right? Small things like lights or planters or soap dishes, compost bins. The next one is for cities or municipalities where we believe we can make their plastic urban infrastructure, like traffic cones or bike lane bollards or construction barrels or the construction barriers. Cities use so much of these plastic objects and they have to purchase them, import them into the city. We waste a lot of energy and we emit a lot of fossil fuels moving material around. So instead of moving all that material around, we could 
recycle it in place from HDPE and turn it into useful products right then and there using only the power of the sun. Governor's Island might soon be getting its own traffic cones made locally and with a special touch. We could mimic the form somewhat of the World Trade Tower because you see it so often as you move around the island and it makes a stronger cone. You might also spot a newly designed buoy on New York's beaches sometime soon. We uh, interviewed lifeguards and we said, you know, if you could redesign this little rescue buoy that you guys use, what would, what would you do? And they said, well, when we give it to the people struggling in the water, the existing ones are kind of like a log. And what happens is people get on them and they roll over them, you know, and in fact, they call it the rescue can. And, you know, I've shown this to lifeguards out here and they said, oh, I really like it because you have to watch that the people don't drown you. So you've got to keep them at, at a distance. And so uh, we made a prototype of it. We're excited to produce this. And if you want to have a part in this new startup or learn more about it, you can go to their free weekend workshops or find them online. For Simply Science, I'm Maria Vami. As of 2021, a full 97% of Americans own a cell phone, with 85% owning a smartphone. Let's find out how they work. We use them every day, calling, texting, posting your lunch on Instagram. You may be using one to watch this right now. But how do cell phones actually work? Like with many common technologies, it's easy to take for granted. When the first cell phone generation came around in the 1970s, the idea was to send the sound of your voice over radio waves instead of wires like landlines, like tuning a radio to different stations. The problem though, is as more and more people want to use a cell phone, you run out of frequencies to use. The solutions are what started bringing cell phone science into the modern age. Today, cell phones still send your voice, of course, but now your phone breaks it down into a pattern of numbers or digits to send instead, hence the term digital, which the receiving phone reinterprets as your voice. And as each new generation of tech has arrived, from second generation, 2G, to 3G, 4G, and now 5G, we've gotten better and better at dividing up the available frequencies in ways to allow more digital traffic. That is, more people, more calls, and more digital data, all at once, without running out of room for everyone. But at the heart of it all is what gives the technology its name, dividing cities into smaller areas, cells, Rather than send each other calls directly, or to one central hub directly, where we'd run out of frequencies with millions of users, we divide a city into cells, each being served by its own towers and base stations. So even though each cell may be using the same frequencies as its neighbor cells, they don't interfere with each other. So in a nutshell, the more cells, the more people who can connect. That's why urban areas have far more cell towers than rural areas. And if you're moving through different cells, your phone will switch its connection to whichever tower and cell station is closest and strongest as you go. This has another benefit as well. It's a major reason why your mobile phone can be so, well, mobile in the first place. By having a lot of cell towers and stations, they get to do the high power work of routing your calls all over the world. Your phone just has to connect to the nearest one. And that doesn't take all that much power. Your phone doesn't need a giant battery or antenna to do that, so it gets to be small and fit in your pocket. And while it may take several relays between phone and cell stations to reach its destination, this all happens tremendously fast. See, while talking travels only at the speed of sound, when your voice is instead turned into a pattern of numbers and digitized by the phone, those digital signals get sent out as electromagnetic waves which are the speed of light. Now, we're surrounded by electromagnetic waves all the time. Sunlight, television signals, x-rays, all waves on the electromagnetic spectrum. Cell signals are carried on the lower, safer end of that spectrum by radio waves and microwaves range. 
Now, if the electromagnetic spectrum can be used to send and receive a call to your mom as a series of pulses and digits, it can do the same for other data too. Digital pulses are digital pulses. And now we have smartphones. Interpreting pulses of digital data as your mom's call or your friend's selfie or the CUNY TV webpage, all of which can be sent and received at light speed along the electromagnetic spectrum to and from cell towers. All that's to say, we hope you're in good cell range the next time your mom calls. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg. With all of the vaccinations of the last couple years, we've all gotten pretty used to medical injections. But as our mygillium shows us, that might be becoming a thing of the past, as new technology is allowing us to deliver medicine through robotic pills. Imagine patients with diabetes being able to say goodbye to painful insulin injections. It could happen with the advent of robo-pills. Bruce Y. Lee is a medical expert at the CUNY School of Public Health. Robo-pills in general are pills that have some type of mechanical device that can do something such as move where the pill goes, release medications in different ways, potentially move to particular parts of the body on their own. Uh, one example of a robo pill is this robo cap that you may have heard of that has been publicized and used recently. Researchers at MIT invented the robo cap. It mechanically spins and burrows into the wall of the intestine. The pills are about the size of a multivitamin. Once it gets to the, your lower GI tract, it can actually burrow into mucus surface of the GI tract and then release medication that is closer to the bloodstream so that it reaches the bloodstream more easily. Researchers have used the devices to inject antibiotics and insulin, but the technology could be used with other drugs. How do robo pills work? The pill has a coating and that coating gets dissolved by the acid that you see in the stomach. And then once the coating is dissolved, that activates the mechanical portion of the pill. And the pill actually has this drill shape around it, sort of like the back of a torpedo. So you can see those things in the back of a torpedo. So it drills actually into the mucosal layer, which is the surface of the intestine, so that can actually get closer to your bloodstream. So what then happens to the device once the medication has been released? One of the key things is to make sure that these devices uh, are either either degrade or uh, a combination of being degraded and excreted. Naturally, you don't want such devices to remain in your intestine. So typically after it's delivered, then to some degree it may be degraded, but ultimately it will be excreted through your GI tract. Randy Therapeutics is one company that has been working on the technology. They declined our request for an interview, but this is their website, touting their work in the field. Lee says the pills offer real benefits to patients. One is they no longer have the pain associated with injections. Your gastrointestinal tract doesn't have the, that same degree of nerve endings, so you're not going to really feel something that might be penetrating the surface, plus, the whole purpose of your gastrointestinal tract is, in big part, is to absorb food and nutrients. Therefore, it is actually easier to reach the blood vessels in your gastrointestinal tract than it is to go through your skin. Another plus is more of the medication makes it into the bloodstream faster. Lee is optimistic we could see widespread use in the coming years. Certainly, anything that offers additional possibilities and potentially can make it easier for patients to get medications, especially medications that are commonly used, uh, is a major advance. So as long as we can make sure that this is something that can be done, one, safely, but two, also reliably. So we want to make sure that it can reliably deliver the medications in the appropriate doses. As long as those are satisfied, then this is a, this is a great idea. So far, the devices have been tested on pigs and humans, but more testing will need to be done before they can be approved by the FDA for human use. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. And that is our show for this month. Until next time, you can talk to us on social media. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg. Ba -ba -dum -dum.